Today on Lockdown Red Wings, a postseason mailbag. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm formerly of 97.1 The Ticket, and Scotty is the host over at Locked On Tigers as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by Indeed. There's no I in team, but there is one in Indeed. And that's the hiring platform you need to build yours. Start now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Locked On. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Indeed you do. Very quickly. Thank you. Uh, Scotty, not a lot really going on this Friday, so I thought it would be a great time to do a mailbag. We haven't done one of those in a while, so I threw that out to the people and got a lot of responses from fans and fellow Lockdown hosts as well. So we'll bounce back between the two of those. And uh, I guess without further ado, unless you got anything you want to add, Scotty, no, happy Friday. Yeah, I mean, happy Friday, baby. Let's uh, let's get into it. Mailbags are, are always fun just because it is – it is, you know, we, we do a lot of prep and like game planning on what we're going to talk about. And mailbags is there's no like second guessing yourself. It's not like, oh, is this actually what people want to listen to today? <laughs> like that goes out the window. We, we know for a fact that this is objectively what people want us to talk about. So that's always it's always nice. Yeah. And so the, the first question that we have today is from a uh, longtime listener, Jen, uh, from Twitter. And she asks. Do we think that Wolman recovers his form, or should that the should the Red Wings just bite the bullet and put Edvinson with Moritz Sider? Uh, this question overall is talking about you know what we think, who we think Moritz Sider's partner is going to be next year, and that's one we've had conversations on and off the air about a little bit here and there. Yeah. But I'd love to talk a little bit more about it here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's a fascinating one. I, I think early on, I would be stunned if like on opening night. This was a Cider and uh, Edvinson pair. But I do think that long-term outlook, maybe. Uh, I just don't think they're taking a... And I'm not in those rooms, obviously. But like I can't imagine that they're taking a ton of stock into the second half for Wallman between getting sick and getting hurt and like everything in between that was happening uh with the team i mean everyone was playing poorly at one point i just can't imagine they're looking at the second half and going you know what like that's that like that's gonna be uh like the type of player he is now i do think something that you mentioned i don't know earlier this week last week time is a construct um yeah uh you you had mentioned earlier uh, in a few episodes ago like the 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 play styles of them together long term is interesting just because like Cider has the potential to be really good both ways, right? Really good defensively, as we know, but he also has that ceiling offensively where Wallman, you know, is an offensive defenseman. So I do think even more so than like returning to form necessarily, I think there's just an argument straight up for like, you can find maybe more of a defensive minded pair partner for Cider long term, and then you can move Wallman down and get offense outside of the top pair that that might just be smarter just in general even if he does look you know as good as he did maybe last year or in the first half of this year yeah it's it's a really tough conversation to have because i thought for i thought they looked fine overall but there were definitely moments where i felt woman was a lot more overmatched getting the deployments and the minutes they were getting than more excited sure. and more excited did at times too because again we've, we've talked about it at death we don't have to go back down to it but Walden should not be getting those de- he should not no. be on a pair that gets almost exclusive defensive zone deployments that's absurd especially with his skill set right like he that's my point right and the reason why they were played together and they were paired that way is they had no defensive depth really that could support the kind of minutes uh to take some of those minutes away from them and also just it, it was just how it had to be. And so they have, they had good chemistry that first year they started playing together, but last year it definitely felt like Woolman got wore down as the season went on. He was a top 10 blo- shot blocker too, just like more Sider. Yeah. Like they were trying and I'm not trying to say, but I think at his peak, Jake Wallman might be a second pair defenseman. I don't know if that changes next year. Will he bounce back to form? I thought what we saw two years ago might have been a little bit more of an outlier 
and what we saw this year might be a little bit more in line with what he is. And that's not a bad thing because considering what we traded for him and what we, you know, how we acquired him for him to become a second pair defenseman is a huge boon. Yeah. Um, but that being said, he's kind of in a weird nebulous spot where because I think Simon Edmondson immediately jumps in to become the, the second pair. Cause I don't think I'm, I don't think to answer the question directly, I don't think Edmondson and Cider will be a pair together next year. It is my dream pair. It absolutely is my dream pair. But if you think about the assignments that Edmondson could take on, you would assume, and you would hope given where he was drafted immediately next year, you know, he might be able to take some of that weight off of Cider's shoulders. So by splitting them up, you get a little bit more freedom for both of them by consequence. Yes, they would be like a, a monolith of a pair. Like they just be, they would be so fun to watch. But I think it would be better served to split them up, especially when we saw how good Sherratt and Cider were down the stretch. Now, I know that was a much smaller sample size. And I know they didn't play well together their first season together two years ago. But I would be going into next year, I, I would want to see Sherratt and Cider again on that top pair and Edvinson on that second pair, because I think Edvinson can in his first full season with the Detroit Red Wings, take some of that weight off of Moritz Sider and free him up to be more of a true, get more of the deployments and the usage of a true one uh, D rather than that weird asinine usage that he got. But where that leaves Wolman, I don't know because Wolman's too good of a defenseman to be a third pair defenseman, but at the For same sure. time, you put him on the third pair and then you don't have to shelter the third pair nearly as much either. So I think, yeah. I think it, it's a good problem to have what they're having right now with the uh, uh, resurgence, not resurgence, but the rise of Simon Edmondson. For sure. I, I, I really think, and we can move on to another question here, but I, I really think that uh, this is a, you know, on opening night and we'll see, you know, they're, they're going to bring in outside help. I'm sure they're going to, you know, trade for sign a defenseman or something um, at, at some point this summer. But I, I think that on opening night, you're probably going to see, uh, it, it be look pretty similar. And then this is going to be something that is adjusted throughout the season. That would be my best bet, right? Like I think on opening night, it still might be Cider Wallman just because they, they've played together a lot. We know that it can work. We'll see what happens early on. And then if, you know, if uh, in the first couple of months of next year, if it looks very similar to how it did in the second half of this year, then you could see those, those adjustments be made. It wouldn't shock me if you know, Edvinson and Sider played together, uh, you know, at some point next season, right? Saying they won't play, to, you know, a single minute together, I think is 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 probably uh, uh, like a little too far the other way. But I think it's just going to be constant adjustments being made. Um, and I also, a big part of that will be what they do with the blue line the rest of the summer as well, obviously. Yeah. And so that makes me wonder too, uh, if I were a betting man, I think you were right. I think it'll go back to being Jake Wallman on the top pair, but I think what I would want to see after seeing almost an entire season of that pair get caved in um, because of the fact that the, the, their deployments were just ridiculous, I, I would want to see Sherratt back up there, but I don't think that'll be because I think that they're pretty staunch Wallman and Sider. And again, see what the preseason the, looks like too. I mean, the, yeah. that's, you know, it's May. <laughs> the, the rise of Edvinson, I think, makes everyone's lives a little bit easier because I think For he's sure. going to be able to come in and take on tough competition pretty quickly might not be the start of the season, but as it goes on and he gets more comfortable, I think you'll see him take some tougher competition and make Woolman and Cider or Cider and Sherrod's jobs easier. But to answer the question, um, I think betting man, it would be Woolman again, but I wouldn't be opposed to Sherrod either how they finish the season. Yeah. The let's also on. again, it's early May. We got, we will, we'll see how the rest of the off season shakes up. For sure. <laughs> right. Uh, let's move on to the next question. I, I'm going to, Jump down to the Bergeron question here. And this question was asked by Jay Forrester and Zach Martin, the Blue Jackets and Hur Hurricanes host, respectively. And they both wanted us to, you know, answer whether or not we think Bergeron will be a full time NHL or and where he will be slotted if he is. And I actually, I actually think this is a pretty easy answer. Wow. Okay. I think he has to be an NHL or with the Red Wings because he has to go through waivers or he has to be traded because yeah. he's not making it through waivers. So I think he will be a full-time NHLR next year because Sprong will be gone and he'll step in to fill that role. And I think he'll play middle six, bottom six minutes as a scoring winger. It, straight up. I think that's just what it is. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's either going to be that here or it's going to be that somewhere else. Like you said, I mean, he'll, he'll be in the NHL. It's just a matter of whether he's a Red Wing or not. 
there's just not a lot of choices at this point. Yeah. So I think he'll he might get power play time. He'll play middle six, bottom six. I'm thinking more bottom six at this point. He's not a young guy anymore. He's not a prospect. No, I'm, I'm like pretty confident he, it'd be bottom six. Yeah. He's played like 70 plus games in the NHL. Like we know what he is. He was drafted in 2018. He's the same age as Philip Zadina. So mm-hmm. I think middle six, bottom six depth score is exactly what he is. So I think that is exactly where, where he'll be. I think it'll be with the Red Wings just because of Daniel Sprong not getting re-signed. I highly doubt he'll come back. And uh, But if not, it'll be with somebody else. So thank you, Zach and Jay, for the question. And uh, we're going to head to segment shout two when we Jay. come back. Huh? I said sh- shout out, Jay. Shout out, Jay. I love Jay. When we come back, we'll keep answering your guys' questions. So stay tuned to Lockdown Red Wings. Got to talk to you guys today about Policy Genius. They're the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare your options with from top companies. And their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Talk to a team of award-winning agents who will walk you through the process step-by-step. Easily compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Check life insurance off your list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash lockdown NHL or click the link in the description to get your life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on NHL. Segment two, Locked on Red Wings podcast. We're continuing with our mailbag episode. And the next question here, and I think I'm going to kind of bundle these next few questions together because they're kind of all in the same vein. Um, This next question also comes from Jay Forrester, but the follow-ups to that will come from some of our followers on Twitter because they are just, like I said, they're all in the same vein. The first one will be from Jay. He asked, how big of a player do we feel the Red Wings will be in free agency this year? And that one, I think you can have a little bit of nuance to. Like, what is the definition of big player? Does making, is because if you're asking me, do I think the Red Wings will make a big splash in free agency? I, as a fan, I think they have to. Uh, but as a uh, analyst, I guess I'll say analyst, a podcast host. I don't know if they, how much they can, right? I don't think we're going to see that flurry of off season moves. We saw last year where they signed 10 plus, they were a big player the last two seasons when I don't think we're going to have that big of an influx, mainly because the consequence of those last two off seasons, we have got a lot of people on contract and we have a lot less cap space to move with. And we have two big name players to sign, but I do think they can be a big player in free agency for one move. And I think that they do have to bring in some, some form of difference maker. Now there's also the possibility that could be via trade, but I don't see them being a big player in terms of volume, maybe quality, but not volume. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, um, I I think the way that Iserman constructs his rosters are for him to be decent sized players every summer. Right. Like that's he as we've talked about a lot, he doesn't sign long term contracts. He doesn't lock up a ton of money for long periods of time. So there's kind of guaranteed like a a little bit of roster turnover and just like churning every year, no matter what. Um, It's just the size of that obviously varies a little bit year to year. I don't expect I think it was 12 if you include the Debrinket trade uh, acquisitions or, or like players brought in last summer. I don't expect it to be that big. Uh, but I, I do, I mean, expect a, a decent amount. Again, I, I I mean, we talked a lot about the blue line and how many moves are kind of just like sitting on the table at the blue line, right? And and uh, the dead money, et cetera. We've had that conversation a lot. But, you know, this, this forward group is there's a lot in the, you know, bottom six that is going to have to be decided upon either re-signing or bringing in new talent. And then we've talked a lot about goaltending and how, you know, I I don't think there's any way they just roll into next season with the goaltending situation being just straight up lying in Huso without at least adding one more kind of depth piece at a minimum. So 
Like you're, you're talking about potential moves in all three facets and all three, you know, positional groups. I, I don't think that it's, it's just going to be nothing. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's probably going to be a, a decent amount yet again. Um, I, I would almost lean the, the other way. I think I I'm kind of expecting, you know, five to seven acquisitions again, like players brought in again. And I'm not really expecting any of them to be like the super like big splash necessarily. Yeah. And see, the reason I disagree with you on that one is because we're expecting more of the youth to make the roster out of training camp. And that's going to be, I, I, I guess I'm including Bear Grant in the youth guys from the minors, right? Bear Grant, we're expecting Carter Mazur, I think is going to make a really impressive push. I think they're going to give Marco Casper looks. I don't know if Marco Casper makes it immediately, but he's going to get looks. I think Carter Mazur's game is going to transition very quickly to the NHL level because of the way he plays. It's not high end, but mm -hmm. it's high intensity. And I think that translates a lot easier to uh, the NHL level. Uh, Albert Johansson, Simon Edmondson are both guys. I, like if we're of the mindset that we want to dedicate more roster space to the NHL roster, uh, for these young guys, then there's not a lot of la there's not going to be enough space left for lots of players to be acquired via free agency. And that's why I'm leaning. If they're a big player, it's because they go after a big fish, not a lot of little fishes like last year and the year before, right. Or medium sized fishes, not to sound disparaging, right? Like if they're going to go after anybody, it's going to be a Jake Gensel, Steven Stamkos, a Sam Reinhardt. If any of those guys even make it's a free agency, because there's a good chance they won't. But uh, I think what this team needs right now, because they are pretty dang deep uh, and they're middle of the road when it comes to the depth, is they still need just another true high-end talent, top six talent, a right side D-man that can be a difference maker. And that takes me to the follow-up questions in the same vein. And this comes from two different people on Twitter, uh, Undrafted Hockey Fan and Emmett Ferguson. They both asked about a handful of different right side demon, which I love the fact that our, our fans are looking at the free agent pile and they're picking through who's going to be available. Uh, undrafted hockey fan asked about Chatfield out of Carolina and Emmett Ferguson asked about DeMello, Pesce and Roy. Uh, and I, be, I'll be honest. I looked at all four of these guys and the only one there, the, I, I guess I should phrase that as this. The one that I liked the most was Matt Waugh with the Los Angeles Kings, or Matt Roy. I want to say Waugh. It might be Roy, actually, but I'm trained to think this way. Uh, <laughs> I could be completely wrong. But And the only reason I say that is if you look at the player usage chart, and here I go again on my... On my, on my goes, I love my graphs. I, I love my graphs. You can see here that everybody else that's been named here, Brett Pesce, Dylan DeMello, Jalen Chatfield, they're all getting heavy offensive zone deployments and what this team needs right now. And all these guys are right side defensemen, which is a team need. We need another right side defenseman. That is a massive need for the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, so I love the fact that our fans are uh, the Red Wings fans and fans of this podcast are looking for that as an answer. But Matt Roy, wah, whatever it is, is the only one who plays somewhat gets pretty even deployments, offensive zone, defensive zone, and gets, you know, tougher difficulty. And you, I, you can see here, I added Petria and Cider on here because I was a first pair and second pair defenseman on the Detroit Red Wings. I wanted to see how this person could stack up to help lighten the load in the defensive zone for some of these pairs. And Roy Wah is the only one who can provide that in any meaningful way. He's an average top four, two way defenseman. Uh, he has some offense. He's had 25 points in 81 games it's not what you're signing him for but he does provide a little bit of it and he had two points in five games with the uh los angeles kings so he's he's a player if anyone because i'm you really only have room to sign one right side defenseman and that's only if you get rid of hole or petrie in reality and you let obviously gossip bear walk uh he averaged on the season he averaged 18 minutes a night so you're in that third pair range with roy but he can take some defensive zone minutes. You put him with Ole Mata, you can give them a little bit tougher assignments so they're not as sheltered as they were when Gossip Bear was on the pair. I think that that could be an upgrade. The other only other option here I liked, Scotty, was Dylan DeMello, and that's just simply because he gets really tough competition. Granted, it is mostly offensive zone deployments, uh, but because of the fact that he gets tough competition and he's lots of minutes in that role, he does perform very well in that role as well. Uh, and the, all these guys are sub 30 years old too. Like they're all young guys. Like people are looking at the right age ranges too, which I really love. So, and DeMello averaged 1933 a night. So around second pair minutes, like third pair, second pair minutes. And uh, so 
those are the only two I like. The one I would stay away from the most is Jalen Chatfield. He didn't get a lot of minutes per night, and he was very sheltered. So I would stay away from him. Yeah, it, it is. It is Roy, by the way. It's Thank Matt you. Roy. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yes, I I like Roy a lot. Uh, I'm I I would be totally fine with that, and I, I don't disagree with anything you said about you know they uh, they two of their biggest needs going in to the off season are going to be. Uh, right side D and going to be a top six winger. And so, uh, or top six, I guess you could even just say forward in general, if they want to get a two C, I don't think anyone would be mad at that either. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, uh, an, uh, both of those are going to be big, uh, talking points. And yeah, I, I really like Matt Roy and, and, uh, uh yeah, that, I'm totally fine with, with that. I think a few of those names are good. We, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, this is going to be, it's going to be a wild summer. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a wild summer, man. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that could happen and, but it doesn't necessarily need to happen. You know what I mean? Like there's, they could just stand pat with the blue line. They could shake it up a boatload. Like there's, there, there's a, there's a lot of potential moves, but not a lot of necessarily guaranteed moves. It's going to be a really, really interesting off season, but yeah, Roy's probably the name I like the most on that list. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to head to another quick break. When we return, we're going to answer a couple more questions and send you guys off into the weekend. So stay tuned to segment three of Lockdown Red Wings. There is no I in team, but there is one in Indeed. Man, deja vu. And that's the hiring platform you need to build yours. When hiring, you need Indeed. They are the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. They streamline st streamline hiring with powerful tools that find you matched candidates with instant match. Over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches the job description the moment they sponsor a job. So join over 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Indeed you do. Segment three, Locked on Red Wings podcast. Scotty. Let's move on to the next question on our docket, and that's going to come from Red Wings Prospects, who we name-dropped, I think, yesterday uh, no. in our replies, asked us, biggest roster concern for next year, A, second line, B, goaltending, and C, right-handed defenseman. Out of those three, what's your biggest roster concern? I have mine. Mine's I know what yours is. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's going to be goaltending pretty, pretty comfortably there. I've been pretty staunch on that already. Um, not only this off season, but dating back to the last month or so of the season, I, I would be very, very upset if they just walked into next season with Lion and Huso. I, I don't think there's any justification for being able to do that. <clears throat> um, I, I don't think either of them are proven enough over a long-term sample size to be able to justify it. And I don't think Kosa is going to be ready on like opening night or the first half of the season, or maybe even next year as a whole. So um, I, I am very, very big on doing something in that. That's not to say the other two aren't obviously still really big needs. We just talked about that, right? I, they, they need, uh, another second, well, I could, I'll just say top six forward, uh, especially if they end up losing Kane, then they definitely need at least one, uh, if not two, even at that point. Uh, and then right side D something we've talked about a lot. Brian's been, been pretty vocal about that too. So uh, all, all our needs, don't get me wrong. All of them need to be addressed in some capacity. Um, but I, I am very big on like, there is no way you can just roll into the fall with, uh, with lion and Huso and just call it a day. Yes. Uh, I don't disagree with you. It's one of those situations where it's like, yes. And, uh, sure. because I lean more towards the, it's so tough because they're all such huge needs, but I'm going to lean more, more towards the second line. And I've been saying this all year long, the second line can't really survive as is unfortunately, because you saw it this year 
without Dylan Larkin in the lineup outside of Lucas Raymond, like the, the, the second, the top six looked kind of abysmal. Yeah. And the depth scoring disappeared. It was great for a while, but when you needed it most, it vanished kind of like the avatar. So you just really need right now a top six winger. I would, I don't want to say I, I I have to say it, but like a genuine bona fide second line center. And I hate going into our third off season asking again <laughs> for a second line center, but like you need one, if not both of those. And obviously, like I just said, cut last segment, you really only have, if the Red Wings are going to go the route, we want them to, they only have the roster space to add a couple of people, in my opinion, to the roster that non goaltender wise, but they really need to at attack the top six because Comfort couldn't handle one C Valeno couldn't handle one C cop can't handle one C if Larkin goes down and Comfort is like an adequate two C, but on like a playoff team. I don't think he is. He's a superb three C and with the avalanche, I know in his final year, he stepped up, but in his tenure there, he was much better on the third line than he ever was on the second line too. So, and they, they were a cup team. So it, it kind of leads into what I'm saying. Like, if you want to be a team that's more consistent scoring, you need another top six talent. Also, so if you want to get better defensively, you also need a top six forward that isn't just lost out there in the defensive zone. And your top six forwards tend to be more skilled, but obviously we know that that doesn't always ring true on the defensive side of things because yeah. we've gone through that error or that list a ton of times. I... But you make the same argument for goalie. Like that's why I say it's yes and because goaltending is a huge need too. I think that they they're going to sign a third goalie. I, I just don't know what the split's going to be for next season. As yeah. far as right-handed D goes, I think they have such a log jam on defense. I think they probably are more than likely to run it back with most of this core as is and maybe acquire one name. Um, but like with how tough it is to get right side D, you're probably going to see more lefty playing right side like. Gossas Bear did this year, or Ajo did with Edvinson down in the minors. I think that's kind of going to be where it's at. You might acquire some depth right side D, like some of our previous questions were asking, but I, I think it's top six forward. Word. Um, the final question we have actually comes from Laura. She is the host of Lockdown Canadiens, another fantastic Lockdown Go. podcast you guys should check out. That they're yeah, they're they do a really great job over there. She asked, uh, given the year and it, how it came down to the wire and in heartbreak, what's the minimum acceptable result at the end of the next regular season from a fan perspective and a front office perspective, because they're not always in line. Uh, I think from a fan perspective, and we can say this from our own perspectives, right? Like we are expecting playoffs, right? That's where after five years of the Eisenman rebuild, that is where our minds are. Like we are ready for the playoffs. They missed by a point. They, they missed by a tiebreaker, not even a point. They missed on a tiebreaker. Th this, this team needs to make the playoffs next year. We need to see that after the second longest playoff drought in the current NHL. Yes, I, I think the fan answer is pretty easily uh, postseason. I, I, we've already we've been saying that since, you know, the second the season ended. It was like, all right, next year you better make the postseason. Yeah. Yeah. Now from the front office perspective, we've had this conversation too. The reality is when you bring in an influx of youth and long-term that can make your team better. If you bring in three or two, three, four young players that don't have a lot of NHL experience, there is an, uh, there is a possibility that your team takes a step back from the veteran presences that were just on the roster. And that is just because they're inexperienced long-term. The team could be better because of that, once they adjust, but there is a real reality that adding youth to the roster will mean the team slides a little bit because progress isn't linear. And I don't want to see that. I, I desperately don't want to see that because I'm tired of doing mailbags in May when the team could be in the playoffs. I'm tired of doing all these other offseason episodes when the team could be in the playoffs. As a fan, I need to see this team in the playoffs. But I also understand the reality that progress isn't linear and adding youth can sometimes make a team slide backwards. And uh, I think they understand that. And I think that there is pressure on Derek Lalonde to, you know, make this team more consistent next year. And I think there is pressure from Steve Eisman on himself because he is a competitor 
to make this team make the playoffs sooner rather than later. But I think they understand that if they miss next year it with an influx of youth, again, a huge assumption there that there's an influx of youth, that that is just natural sometimes with progression. And they'll be looking for progress in other areas too. I mean, we've seen it with so many other teams, teams that make the playoffs one year, fall out for another year or two, and then they become that threat long-term. Like the Devils. I mean, perfect example. The Devils had 100-plus points last year. This year, combined with you know injuries to Jack Hughes, they missed the playoffs, and they are drafting like sixth. So, I mean, that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, that that's just why I, I don't believe that we're just going to see like – five or six rookies or whatever, like on the roster next year. Like that's why I, I don't I think, think they'll see five or six either. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't expect them to, I don't expect to see four. I don't expect to see three on opening night. I, I don't think we're going to have like three NHL debuts on opening night next season. Like I don't, um, I, 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 that's why I think that they're going to, this, this front office has been very consistent year in and year out with acquiring uh, veteran depth to not like force the issue to be in a position ever where young players quote unquote have to play at the NHL level. I don't know why they would just randomly start this year. So like, I, I, I think that they're going to find ways to work them in, right? Edvinson finally got an opportunity later than what a lot of the fans wanted it, et cetera, et cetera. I don't expect them to just like about face their, you know, seeming like they're, 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 uh, mindset they've had on on young players for the last like three seasons um, randomly when they finally get over 90 points. I So I, I still expect them to go out and, and bring in veterans, make some depth moves uh, similar to what they did last year, but I'm certainly not expecting, you know, double digits or anything crazy like they did last year. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I do think that the front office is in a position where like this is, the, and we talked about it a couple weeks ago, but like this is the the most important part of a rebuild. This is where rubber meets the road, man. Like this is where you gotta you, you either you know take off or or you like go back down and, and you really have to walk that fine line. And it is a very fine line of continuing to develop your talent while also putting together a competitive, you know, playoff caliber NHL team. And that's a that's a very, very tough job. Let me add to that, right? Like what you were saying is true. And what I was saying, you know, I want to add to what I was saying in that this team, I think that there's pressure on them to make the playoffs now because they became so close and they do understand the reality they could slide. But I think because of that, that's why Iserman, with the understanding of what this team's current holes are, he saw it, right? And we all saw it. And I know he knows is going to make an effort to try and adjust that. And we go back to what we talked about with the who stays, who goes conversation, right? It's going to have to be a mix of youth and more veteran presences, which is why even though there's what four to five roster spots max available on this team next season, unless they trade away some guys, it's going to have to be a mix of both to make sure this team doesn't take a step backwards, but is able to get over the hump into the playoffs. And there's a, you got to also understand like, Next year, it's going to probably take more to make the playoffs. It's not going to be 92 points or 91 points on a tiebreaker. It might be back to 95, 96. So they're going to, they're going to have to be five, six points better to make the wild card, I would imagine. And so that's going to take some really clever roster management by Steve Eiserman. Yeah, big time. Uh, thank you to everyone who asked us questions. And sorry, we couldn't get to everyone. There's just too many questions to get to. And that is a good thing. We appreciate your guys' uh, readiness to be Long involved in this. Two. I'm sure we'll have yeah. more. Oh, we'll do more. So uh, with that being said, Scotty, do you have any final thoughts? I don't think so, man. We ball. We ball. We're back with a new episode on Monday. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day. Every day.